Huntington in 1968 with uh, working with Ralph Nader. Um, I had before that worked uh, in law school and undergraduate school uh, in the Ohio legislature. And uh, before that, I had worked in a lot of other political activities. So I was actually, a, I've been an activist. Uh, my parents would say I was born an activist. You know, I can remember trying to organize the kindergarten when I was five. <laughs> but um, but, but my, my point that I make in discussions like this is that uh, it's a skill. The way that you deal with a legislative group is a skill. And um, we, uh, uh, we, we met uh, in a uh, meeting that we've, we're, we've been holding with people who come from around the country to Washington, and then we have actual lobbyists train them in how they can go up on the hill and talk to their member of Congress or the staff. And uh, so first interesting point is that uh, if you talk to the staff person at a congressional office, that's as good as talking to the staff, to the congressional person themselves. The staff people actually may be more important because they actually control the agenda on the issue that you're talking about. Um, uh, our objective in the project that we're doing, which is called Voice for Hope, Healers of Planet Earth, that the idea is to bring to the attention of members of Congress the notion that there's a system of uh, health that is outside surgery, radiation, and drugs. That would be the complementary alternative integrative medicine world. And the idea is to get a language going with these people in the congressional offices so that they hear these concepts in a less charged way than they will hear them when they are shaped up into an issue. And that's the second really important point, that you want to, the, the, the concept of moving an agenda forward, the most important question, the uh, most important action in moving an agenda forward is defining the issue. If you, if you, if the other side manages to define the issue and get it on the agenda, and you have to come and try to change that, you will have a really difficult time. Well, let's. Uh, so let me digress just for a moment and uh, talk about Congressman Kucinich um, and help use it as an example of how I think we can relate to policymakers. And first of all, I think if you uh, are you going to get a copy of that speech. It was, it was all written, so I think you should get a copy and post it because I think it was a really good uh, presentation of the context of uh, policy making demand inside a framework of the whole culture and science and so on. So I think it's a really good thing to get. So um, Dennis Kucinich uh, actually for many years was my congressman from Cleveland. That's I'm from Cleveland, uh, and I he has the Croatian seat in Congress, which is what my ethnic background is. Uh, and I think there's only one, I'm not sure. But um, he's a very interesting character in terms of our political process. So he was the youngest mayor of Cleveland, like youngest mayor anyway, I think he was 26 when he was elected mayor of Cleveland. And it's very interesting to observe what happened to him in that process, because he had the same kind of uh, progressive politics then that he has now. and. Uh, started implementing them in Cleveland. Cleveland's a very interesting progressive city in many ways. Uh, it had, uh, at the turn of the century and for the first decade or so of the last, the last century, the 1900s, he, uh, uh, Cleveland had a famous mayor whose name was Tom L. Johnson, and he invented a whole bunch of things like public power. So that Cleveland had a public power system. And gradually, and there were many others, but just focus on that, um, gradually the power um, the private power companies ground down that public power presence. Public power was one of the main issues, 30s, 40s, 50s, it was a major powerful social issue. And, um, and uh, the private power companies ground it down, ground it down in Cleveland until the Cleveland uh, public power entity was all it was doing was buying power from the private companies and then redistributing it to the to the public. I mean, it was not actually generating or doing any of the things that it was designed to do. And Kucinich stepped in and thought he would, among all of his other progressive things, try to reinvigorate that private power situation. And he really got 
the corporate leaders of Cleveland angry. I mean, really angry. And um, now he's the mayor, and the mayors of Cleveland have had a, a pretty solid political career. They've gone from mayor to senator, and then sometimes into the cabinet, and then sometimes out of the out of the court. It's a good it's a good solid place to be. But in Cleveland, uh, what happened is that the corporate power structure got together and did something that had never been done before, which was to call the Cleveland city mortgages. So the banks had mortgages on things that were going on in Cleveland. The city borrowed money. So the city owed money to the banks. That had been true for years and years and years. It's kind of the way things are. You know, you borrow money and then you pay it off, and you borrow some more and you pay it off. But the power system decided that the way they would punish the city and basically get rid of it was to call those loans. And so they went and put, they put uh, repossession notices on Cleveland police cars. Uh, and basically, Kucinich was basically hounded out of office. And he was, I think, ran again and was defeated. I'm not exactly sure how the data amount was. But basically, once that sort of happened, and, and he, was, he was also getting a national reputation for his leadership. And he was just basically pushed out of politics for all intents and purposes. They, you know, put their hands off and they said, well, we got rid of that guy. And then fortunately, he came back in Congress and uh, has been able to work from that seat. Now, it's important to understand that they never rest. So, in the last census, Ohio lost two seats right. in Congress. Right. And so, um, the Republican legislature has redistricted. And what they did is take two very good, very progressive members of Congress. Uh, one was Mary Kapter from Toledo and the other Dennis Cassidy from Cleveland and put them in the same district. So the district goes from Toledo, which is you know over to the west, right across the lake here in Cleveland, and they're running against each other in the primary. And they've announced that they are they are friends. They're, uh, they're they, it's unfortunate they're not going to be uh, at least so far nasty, mean, and undercutting uh, because they are both very supportive of each other. And she's saying that she's going to you know focus on the things that she's done for Cleveland over the years. And he's talking about being able to talk about the entire district, and they have a primary gun. And uh, probably, I mean, from one perspective, uh, in terms of a congressional seat, it will be a seat that is going to be moving forward on these kinds of issues in general, I believe. Whoever wins. You need to think about, if you want to uh, help uh, Dennis Kucinich, how to get all those people that live between Toledo and Cleveland to know that this primary is really important from the standpoint of these kinds of issues. From my perspective, I don't think you will hear many members of Congress talking in the kinds of terms that Dennis talked this morning. Yeah, of course. That's just not the way people in Congress talk. Right. So, in some ways, that's a double-edged sword. On the first, the first way is it does get language going into Congress that is valuable and significant and useful and helps open up some of the thinking. That's how his hearings were seen. <coughs> On the other hand, if Dennis introduces a piece of legislation, all the establishment lobbies say, well, we don't have to worry about that because with his name on it, it's never going to go anywhere. I mean, it's, he's, a, he's the Ron Paul of the left. And so the, the, what we like to do, from our perspective, we like to have a lot of fun pulling their tails, is we like to get bills introduced by Dennis Kucinich and Ron Paul. And we put them in there and then say, okay, now deal with that, folks. <clears throat> we don't do that because we are trying to win that issue. We do that because we're trying to raise that issue or define that issue. But um, in any case, that little, the vignette of Dennis Kucinich's political life well, should give you some sense of the way that the power system works. Now, if you're not a person of the kind of character that Dennis Kucinich is, and you're just the average, normal person that wants to be a congressperson, mm -hmm. then uh, you're going to succumb to those. First of all, they'll come and talk to you and say, look, if you don't do what we want to do, we're going to call the loans on your police cars. And 99 out of 100 of the politicians that we know in this country will say, fine, we'll do what you want. And then there are other things that they can do that will cause you to, you know, as a person in Congress or mayor or whatever, that will cause you to be agreeing to whatever the demands are. So you need to know, you need to understand, that's the world that this is all going on in. Now, let's go back to what I was talking about before that. And we have an object lesson having seen 
uh, what happens, you know, seeing, you know, in my telling you uh, what it's like to be a person like Dennis Kucinich in the political process. Um, the uh, idea of defining the issue is the key first step in, in moving forward. Uh, you can, now there's two part, there's a lot of part, first of all, I'm giving you my view of the way to do this. I, uh, my experience is that it dovetails well with the professional lobbyists. Uh, I think that they're doing roughly the same thing I'm talking about, although I'm not sure they would talk about it in these terms. I mean, if you're hired by utility industries to go up on the hill and convince a congressman to vote your way, the issue has already been set. You're not doing that. Someone else has done that for you. And you're just going in there and, and carrying out the water for them. But I think that this whole process needs to be understood in order to realize what it is that you're up against. So, in our Voice for Hope process, we are entering the process at the pre-issue point. We're going in and just talking to these people, and this is what I want to talk about most, is to, is to kind of conceptualize in your mind that people who are in Congress, and by the way, our plan is to do Congress, and this is the next, I'm gonna come back to the issue which, uh, point in a moment, but the, the, the step that we want to take is to get connected with the National Congressional Office as a constituent, and have that national office introduce us to the local office in the district, or in the hometown as we call it. And that brings us to a key point. Remember that whoever is in Congress from your hometown, your neighborhood, your area, is another person in your community. Doesn't matter whether they're left, right, middle, whatever, they're from your community and they're the person that is there to represent you. And you have an actual uh, an actual advantage in going into their office over anybody who's not one of their constituents, even the lobbyists that come from the um, industry. There, what, did he, what do you say, how can I help? How can we help you? I'm running for office. Right. That's the number one reality for all of these people. The, 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 uh, the equation of politics is in order to win elections, you either need to have people or money. If you don't have people, you have to have money. Think about that the next time you hear about politics being jammed with money. The reason it's jammed with money is that the people that are spending all that money don't have people. What do they do with that money when they get it? They go out and they buy people. They create a fake public interest group of some kind. You know, watch for the thing that says, uh, you know, citizens to end. Uh, citizens to make safe cell phones or something like that and then look to see who funds it and what they do when they have lots of money among other things is create a group that goes forward and says we're, the, we're speaking for the public. In politics if you don't have people you got to have money. On the other hand if you don't have money you got to have people. So the idea here is your people and you should become you and all of your friends should know, be, you, should, you should be able to answer the question, who is my member of Congress? At any cocktail party, anywhere you are, you should be able to answer that. You should also know, where do they live in your, in your community? Where's their office? Who's their office director in the community? Because when you begin to start your dynamic with that congressional office, there's somebody right down the street that you can call up and become friends with. What we're counseling people who are doing lobbying is make sure that the person you're trying to persuade thinks about you whenever they think about the issue you're on. So just take healthcare from the standpoint of Voice for Hope. Healthcare. There's going to be some kind of a healthcare debate and the person in Congress is going to have to be involved in it. And they're going to say to themselves, okay, I'm going to be involved in this debate now. Who do I have to consider? I have to consider uh, the doctors. Uh, I have to consider the pharmacists. I have to consider the hospitals, the insurance people, all in my district. Those are all local things. They all have a local presence. We, the first goal is to be sure that when they're ticking off that list, they think, and i got to consider those people who are concerned about, let's just say, cell phones. Uh, we had a situation when we lobbied for the Organic uh, Food Protection Act, uh, uh, Food Production Act in 1990. Uh, I knew we were going to win. 
And I knew because we got a report that the chairman of the Agriculture Committee, whose name was Kiki De La Garza, and he was a wild congressman from Texas, and he was the chairman of the Agriculture Committee, which made him one of the you know top ten powerful Congress people. And uh, he was he. We got a report that he had a meeting of the people in his in his decision making circle, which included some members of his committee, some staff people, and so on. And he said, okay, now here's what we need to do. We've got to get this for the cattlemen. We've got to get this for the vegetable and uh, fruit farmers. And we've got to get this for the wheat people. And we've got to get something for the organic boys. That's when I knew that we were going to win that issue. Like I was a year before the bill actually passed. And then we had to still lobby because the agriculture community did not want any organic food. They did not want that. They were opposed. And the, and the um, food industry was opposed, and the chemical industry was opposed. They did not like this idea of organic. What was interesting, let me, let me tell you that little story, you'll get a feel for some things. So what was interesting is that the big debate that had been at the heart of the organic movement from 1948, when I first heard about it, until 1990, when it was a question before Congress, was how do you know whether something's organic or not? So the first question was, what is the definition of organic? And the second question is, how do you enforce organic? So there were two huge debates going on. There were two huge teams that were pro-organic. One team had what was called a um, they had a, a standard that was at a point of purchase standard. And their idea was that you would go into a store and you'd pull off goods from the shelf and then you would test them in the laboratory and you would determine whether they were organic or not. That's bad. That's a bad idea. First of all, you can only detect a very small number of the pesticides that would be in food uh, using that method. The alternative one, and this is very important for any issue, because that debate will exist in any issue, the important question, what, the alternative issue, which is the important one, and it's true in your issue and every issue, was the systemic approach. What is the system that we're dealing with? What is the system that is being addressed here? And so the issue that came up in the organic framework was how do we address the system of agriculture so that we can have organic be a part of it? And so the bill that was drafted and this is the next, you really need to know this, this is where you're defining the issue. You have to have a proactive position that you're for, something that you're for, that you believe in. You can't be against cell phone radiation. You gotta be for something. So okay. far, so far the issue is information for the public. I mean, that's the lowest level that you can enter an issue with. Information for the public, because we don't really know I mean, if I was going to design this and I wanted to win and I, I really wanted to, to, to sweep the day, I would say, uh, we can do all the things you can do with a cell phone with this other set of technologies that is safe and effective and so forth. But we don't have that to put on the table at the moment. So now we have to say, the last thing that Dennis said in the speech was, we have to say, the public has to be engaged in making our decisions as we go forward by making sure that they have all the information necessary to make their to make the choices that will affect how this technology is integrated. Okay, so we go back to the organic model as an example. And the idea was to create a systemic uh, alternative. And so what happened is the, the Organic Food Production Act contained a whole system of creating organic. And this is what's in force now. And if you use the word organic and you aren't inside this system that I'm going to describe very quickly, it's a $5,000 a day fine. Yeah, that's the structure of the law. And the organic definition can, means that you have to have land that is certified free of pesticides and other chemicals for three years. You have to grow all of your stuff using only ingredients that are approved by the Organic Food Production Board. It's a board, it's got organic farmers on it, it's got agricultural officials and so forth, and they set a, they create a list of all the things that you can use in organic, and you can't use these. Now, you get a feel for what kind of issues we have in our culture when one of the things they had to decide was organic farmers, to some extent, use sawdust. 
The question was, what kind of wood does the sawdust come from? Is it treated wood or not treated wood? And that had to be addressed by the Organic Food Production Board in order to say whether or not it could be used. And been one of the big, there's been many debates about organic because the industry's objective now is to push every piece of crap that they can come up with into the organic definition. So they wanted to use sewage from city sewage plants as, as fertilizer. And we had, a, a, we had to oppose that. They wanted to use GMO. They want to allow GMO in organic. They had to oppose that systematically. They never stop. Just understand. They never stop. It's an engine. You can create, you can, just to say there's, you know, 10 million people that work in these corporate entities from the lobbyists to the president and all the people that are involved. You could take all 10 million of them and put them over on the side and get another 10 million in and they would act the same way. Because it's the system that is, 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 is creating this and they just grind and grind and grind moving forward. And as I was saying to Mary Beth when we were driving down, one of the tragedies of the whole situation is that the people who are grinding us down on, um, on the whole uh, EMF issue are themselves being ground down on the GMO issue. And you might find a GMO activist who's a lobbyist for the EMF people. I mean, it's really quite bizarre. Uh, I, uh, uh, we're, we're working on our uh, Voice for Hope uh, presence to create a large context for all of these issues so that people can understand that when you argue for when you argue for unfettered wireless and when you argue for GMO and when you argue for nuclear power, you're making the same argument. It's the same argument. We have a technology that's going to solve our problems. The future of the world depends on it. And if we don't do it, we're all going to end up in a ditch. And all the people who are against it are crazy luddites. Right. And that's the debate we're having in the society. But the real issue is there are dozens of these new technologies coming along. And you mentioned a couple of them already. But there are dozens of them all over the place. And the question is, what are the mechanisms of our society to, do, to address those and figure out how we're going to relate to them? Are we going to integrate them? Are we going to manage them? Are we going to reject them? And it's all integrated as a, a debate, as a discussion. And so if you're going to define the issue and, you, and the issue gets defined as cell, phone, uh, cell phones are safe or unsafe, I think we lose. We don't lose because of the truth of the question. We lose because of the process that Dennis Kucinich laid out this morning. We will not know the answer to that question for years and years and years and years. But we have to decide how to relate to that question now. Now, if the issue is, do cell phones, just use cell phones for the road, pose enough of a risk that we need to seriously engage the following kinds of uh, mechanisms to deal with integrating them into the culture, we could win that battle. We could win that battle. We cannot win a battle that says they're unsafe, therefore we have to do the following things. Uh, we've had that battle on all the food additives that come along. You know, just If we have to prove they're unsafe, we lose. If they have to prove they're safe, they lose. So we're constantly trying to force them to prove that they're safe. Uh, in order to, we were doing very well in the uh, in the 70s. There were no food additives introduced between 1969 and 1979. No new food additives. I mean, they were they tried, but they were blocked, including nutrition. And and what they figured out was let's go around that process. Let's not allow these issues to get involved in that process. And that's how GMOs went around the process. There's no logical reason in the world why GMOs aren't food additive and they have to be shown to be safe before put in the food supply. I mean, that's what Congress intended, that's what the law says, but it went around it. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sketching up a little bit about how you define the issue will be determinant of whether you win or lose on that issue. And whoever gets to lay out that framework is the one that's going to win. Now, we, we argue that you need to have a very simple issue statement. And I actually just the other day I was working with some of our, our, our local groups and uh, one of the ideas we came up with, which I now I'm gonna push everywhere I go, is you should be able to put your objective, your goal, your statement, your issue, on a business card. Yes. 
you should be able to have your name and address on the front and on the back it should say uh, one sentence or two sentences that fit on that card that you can just start giving out to people. And you can do it as an individual. And then you can get together with other individuals and sort of meld your messages and so forth. But that statement needs to be that simple. And I believe it needs to be a positive statement. What are we for? Not what are we against. What are we for? We're for the public knowing everything there is to know about EMF. And you need to, you know, think about how you're going to word it and put it out there, and start moving the issue toward your definition of the issue. And it takes some thinking to plan how that that goes, and and understand that when that flag's planted, the outcome of the battle has pretty much been determined. I mean, you'll go through all these fights and so forth, but out the other end will come something that is reflective of that statement. So in, in the organic battle, what happened was. All the agriculture interests were opposed to organic production. And the agriculture interests chokehold on national policy is the agriculture committee in the House. If you can't get your idea through the agriculture committee in the House, then you're dead. And organic wasn't going to get through that committee, period. But the chairman said, what can we do for the organic boys? And we had a, a Congressman Brown from California was our advocate on that committee. Very powerful, strong, significant guy. And uh, he did something that you, you need to know about when you're thinking of lobbying, which is quite interesting, is he negotiated agreements with the people who opposed him on that committee, which was a majority, to not have a vote in the committee. They just reported it out to the floor of the House and said the House members were free to vote however they wanted to on organic food production. That was a tremendous victory. When it went to the House floor, 75 or so, and I'm putting this in quotation mark, green urban, as they were called in the paper, voted for the Organic Food Production Act, and that's how it became law. That would not have happened if it hadn't been for the chairman saying, what can we give the organic boys for our minority guy to have negotiated an agreement that the chairman of the committee supported, and all the guys on the uh, committee said, okay, we're not, okay, we won't fight you on this. And it got through. Interestingly enough, we had a hearing in which, we, we did some other lobbying things that were interesting uh, to just give you, I suppose it's useful to know this. Uh, we had our first hearing, Senator um, Daschle was the sponsor of the bill at the time, and we had our first hearing and he runs hearings differently than, or he ran hearings differently than other senators in that uh, he has a round table and they all sit around the table and he sits at the front and he conducts a conversation. And our organic speak people on that, in that round table kept making the argument that there should be a special law for us who are small and we don't actually, we should not have to comply with all these other laws that are involved here in agriculture because we're small, we're special, we're great, yeah, yada, yeah. And he just tore them up one side and down the other. He said, you sound like the, the local banks. You, that's just, you can't do that. That's wrong, wrong, wrong. Okay, so there we were with the lobbying problem. What we did, and we had a very good lobbyist working with us, and what we did was to have a meeting with Senator Daschle and, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Daschle and Senator Luger. They were the two key guys at that point. Luger being the senior Republican on the Agriculture Committee, Daschle being the sponsor of the bill and the chairman of the committee uh, was on our side. So, we had a meeting in which we brought 25 organic food production people to lunch with Senator Dash. It cost us $5,000, incidentally. Mm -hmm. Pay to have lunch with the senator. That's the way it works. So, he came and uh, the 25 people were trained to take less than 30 seconds to introduce themselves. I'm Sam Smith, I'm from Michigan, my company produces $100 billion worth of organic food and we employ 79 people. And we went around the table with the 25 people. By the time we were done, it was about a billion and a half worth of sales and several, you know, several thousand jobs. And in that moment, the whole image of organic food changed. When we went that evening and paid another $5,000 to have lunch with Luger, or dinner with Luger, who was very interesting, because Luger 
stayed like for two hours, had this huge conversation, talked about the fact that he has a running chart in his office. Another thing to think about. Learn who your congressperson is. What is their personal life like? What do they think about? What's important to them personally? So Luger's got a running chart, and he's got all the people in his office run every day and write down how much. And he's talking about health and why it's important, and this organic food could fit into that, yada, yada, yada. And our little movement was moving ahead of the power curve at that point, just ahead of the power curve. And then the big day came when they mark up the bill in the Senate. And that's a meeting where everybody gets together, and they all sit around, and people in the audience yell out stuff, and they write it in the bill. That's what the lobbyists have a hate it. You know, they come in there and say, well, I think the bank should get a fifth and on, and it's in, whatever. And these guys sit up there and write it into the bill. I mean, it's bizarre. Okay, so Senator Dahl, who was the minority leader at that point, comes in and says to Senator Luger, and to Senator, um, uh, I think Dasher might have been in the chair at that point, but whoever the other one was, the other Democrat, okay, this is great, we love organic, what we think we should do, and I talked to the president, and it, 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 what we should do is have a study commission for the next five years, to do agriculture every five years, for the next five years, and see if there's any role for agriculture in, in the, for organic in our agriculture system. That was where they had positioned themselves, as to the agricultural interests, to block organic. So Lee Luger looks at, Dash, looks at Dole and says, Senator Dole, I know that you're the senior person in the Senate for all the Republicans, and I know that you're an ex officio member of every committee, but I want to remind you that I'm a senior Republican on the Agriculture Committee, and we just met with the chairman last night, and we worked the bill out, and this is what we're gonna do. And that was the winning play, because once that bill was done, it was supported by both sides, and then we got it through the Senate. Now, all of that gives you a sense of how lobbying works on the Hill, but the backbone of it is who pays the congressman to re get reelected, or but let's define our own issue. How do you get the people to support the congressman for re-election? That's different than who pays for it. Mm -hmm. And if you have people who know the congressman, who are bringing their issue to the congressman or the congresswoman, they're talking to them directly, they're discussing with them, they're friendly. I mean, we had a woman that came from Pennsylvania, and all our alternative health people are just terrified to come up here and talk to congressional people. I mean, they're just terrified. And they went in, we've had 85 meetings so far, and every one of them except one has been positive. The one that wasn't positive was two people that didn't go through our training. So they went up and started arguing about, why don't you pay for alternative medicine? Why don't you, you know, this is better than the other stuff. That is not the way we talk when we go up there. We go up and say, there are maybe 200,000 people in your district using alternative medicine. What you want to do is figure out how you get your, your, your messages on the back of the <coughs> so How can you say the people in your community support that? And you say it directly to the congressman because there's another guy coming in there with, who's been paid to come in there who's saying, you know, the people in your district hate what you're doing here. If he's got people from his district talking to him saying, we love what you're doing, it's a whole different story. And one of the things I like about this approach, uh, which is my, it's, 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 I think, I've watched it happen many, many times without people articulating it. I'm articulating it this way, and the reason I like it, or one of the reasons I like it, is it fits with the American mythos, the American mythology about how process works. I have no idea whether it works the way we say it works or not, but I do know that a guy in Congress or a woman in Congress who knows people will listen to those people before he will listen to anybody else. We had an issue on NutraSuite with uh, Senator Metzema, who we, uh, my family had, had known Senator Westman died a couple years ago. We have known him since I was one year old. And so he got involved in this NutraSuite issue on his own. I didn't get him involved. He got involved. And the, comp the um, NutraSuite company hired a guy to lobby Metzema. And the guy was an old auto worker organizer. And Metzenbaum was a major labor lawyer. That's how he got to be Metzenbaum. And he's very progressive, very left. And here, here comes this left-wing organizer from the streets telling Metzenbaum, you know, you're wrong on this nutrition question. It really is a great additive. It really doesn't cause brain cancer. It really is a good thing. You know, Metzenbaum said, well, why did the FDA Board of Inquiry say it shouldn't be put on the market? And he said, well, they were just wrong. You know, all, the whole industry line, and Metzenbaum said he walked out the door with his, put his arm around him and said, you know, Harry, 
your bosses are real bastards. <laughs> what he got was, here's, here's a guy who'd been crushed by the corporate community for years, hired to advance the corporate community's interest on something else that he didn't know anything about. So Metzenbaum was, in that instance, motivated in his own way about this issue. We got 27 votes in the Senate to put labels on New Jersey. Then that 27 is not enough uh, to count here for it. But my point again is, who you, the people you know will have more of an influence on you as a legislator than people you don't know. So the process is, how do you get those people in there? And that's what we're talking about doing. Then what do they hear when they hear from you? They hear a positive, simple message. People should know the information about wireless so they can make their own choices. I don't know if that's the message you want to say, but that to be a kind of a simple message. Mm -hmm. And then you work, you get as many people from that district as you can to go down to the district office. The congressman comes in or the congresswoman comes in you know, several times a year. And so you say, well, what do I want to meet? We want to just talk. I want to tell you how things are going. And maybe there's going to be a, a constituent meeting. So we'd like this on the agenda of the constituent meeting. And, if, and now, if you coordinate so it's happening all across the country, you know what you get? You get the Tea Party. The difference is, hopefully, we've done some thinking before we've done this part. And we have some idea of what we're after. We have some proposals. Don't get alienated from the person in Congress. If you're a left-wing radical and they're a right-wing fascist, be their friend. Okay. They're just somebody else down the street. What if somebody moved in next door to you that had different politics? Would you immediately pick a fight with them? No. When you're riding on an airplane, do you pick a fight with the person next to you? No. Why pick a fight? Yeah. On this issue where we, it really is nonpartisan, would you suggest a Democrat and a Republican going together to speak? Well, let me let me make another point. And this is a little more a little more advanced than I and I wasn't going to get into. But I we, we are working all of our stuff out of something we call transpartisan. Mm -hmm. Transpartisan. Yes. yes. Okay. Partisan is like if we had a, if we we're going to walk, and we decided to have the decision about how we walk made the way we do politics. So we get two teams, and we say, well, I think we should walk on our left foot. And the other team says, no, I think we should walk on our right foot. <laughs> well, that's, okay, how are we going to do? Okay, we'll have a vote. 51, 49, we'll walk on our right foot. So we're walking on our right foot. <laughs> that didn't work. All right, let's have another vote. Okay, let's do our left foot. Doesn't work. Let's do both feet. That's bipartisan. Bipartisan is the Republicans and the Democrats stealing from the public together. That's the way it's defined in Washington. I don't know if you know that. Uh, <laughs> Transpartisan is, hey, these guys on the right have some ideas. These guys on the left have some ideas. You put them together, and holy cow, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and pretty soon you're moving forward. Yeah. The idea that any particular viewpoint has got all the truth, and the other viewpoint has none of the truth, is one of the worst <laughs> things going on in our American politics. Yeah. You have about 15% of people on one side saying that, 15% on the other side, and if you add that up, that leaves you 70% sitting around saying, what are these people talking about? <laughs> and right now in America, if you track um, identi voter identification, about 30% of the public identifies as either a Republican or a Democrat. Now, that doesn't mean 70% define themselves as the independents, because there's a whole bunch of people who don't define themselves as anything. They just don't vote. They just don't participate. They're sitting out there saying, even the people who are independents are nuts. <laughs> that group of 70% is really the ones that are at the core of making the society work, and they're being systematically excluded from politics, you know, by their own choice, by the system, and so forth. The process I was describing is the way I think we can start getting them back into the, into the process. And so I would integrate them. And I don't care whether there's two Democrats or two Republicans, or a Democrat or a Republican, or an independent, or a Green Party, or whatever. They're people from the community. They're your, it's some, it should be somebody that should be friendly. I don't think you should take two people who are enemies and go in and try to have a conversation with people in Congress. You want people who are friends. And you'll discover if you, you know, if you have a dinner party, I will submit to you that the political framework of that dinner party is not going to be identified as some narrow group of people who only, only have this set of ideas and they all agree on all these issues. It will not be. Your friends aren't like that. But the process moves through those kinds of relationships. 
And so I would say, I wouldn't make it be a Republican or a Democrat. If it turns out to be a Republican or Democrat, it's a nice thing to point out, but I wouldn't organize it that way. Right. Okay, another question? Uh, I guess a comment. Yeah. I mean, I, I would submit that, um, you know, you talked about what are we for mm -hmm. and an overarching statement. I would say we're for protecting people from microwave radiation. Because, you know, we're talking about a lot of different issues, cell phones, Wi-Fi. Well, let me, let, okay, let me, let me just take so, what you said. Right. Let me just take what you said. If we're for protecting people from microwave radiation, we're going to get a lot of enemies that we don't need. If we're for giving people the tools so that we together can protect ourselves <coughs> from radiation, I think we can win. And it's, it, it goes to the consumer protection movement, which people don't like very much because it's a third party stepping in. And as soon as you give a third party the right to step in, they start making your choices for you. It goes from consumer protection to consumer empowerment. And you, you have the consumer empowered to have the tools to be able to participate in protecting themselves individually, their communities, the, the culture, the, the country, and so forth. So, so I would argue that what we want is to empower people to be able to protect themselves and their communities against. Is that fair? I mean, you, and, and, but that's a very tricky thing to watch out for because if you start down the road of consumer protection, you give extra tools to the to the guys that are on the other side. They'll beat you up. Because your fight will be, how come the FDA isn't doing what it's supposed to be? How come the FTC isn't doing what it's supposed to be? Those fights are fights that, that those those systems have all been gained against us. The one place they can't get away from is the right of the individual to protect themselves. And, and then build from that. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm, that's so, just neat. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been trying to uh, convince people in, in this movement that we need uh, a slogan that's about four words that would encompass. Why are you trying to convince say, anybody of that? Pardon? Why are you trying to convince anybody? Why don't you just write the slogan and put well, it out? I'm, I'm working on that actually. But uh, the fact is that normally we all have these very long, wordy, scientific mm -hmm. explanations. And I've been trying to explain. I don't think that sells. That we need something short, easily understandable, as you said. Um, okay, if you're right, and you could come up with a four-word four yeah. slogan, and if I'm right, I agree with you, and you put it out, it should take hold. Should take hold. People should just start using it. Right. And if they don't, then you go back to the drawing board and come up with something else. Absolutely. Yeah. So what, yeah. I, what I hear you saying, Jim, um, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, is if, if we put it out, we want to protect people from RF, then we're getting in the debate as to whether or not RF is uh, uh, harmful or not. But if we bring it down to consumer protection, then that consumer we're, empowerment. We're, 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 I mean empowerment. Then then we're taking it out of the realm about arguing whether it's um, harmful or not, and just putting. Uh, channeling information to the you're, you're not, you, yeah, yes, yes in principle, however, you don't take, the, the debate doesn't go away. You can still participate in the debate. You can say, look, I think people should know all the information there is to know. That's what we're here for. Now, I happen to think, now, I, I'll, I'll tell you the moment that I figured out that the cell phone issue, that I was on this side and not that side of the cell phone issue, it was like almost 20 years ago now, and I'm driving along, and this guy's on the radio, and the issue is, this cell phone's got brain cancer. And this guy's a consultant from the cell phone industry. And he says, no, it doesn't. And the reason I know it doesn't is because the tumors that occur where the, the cell phone is held up by your, by your ear are benign tumors. <laughs> and I'm sitting there saying to myself, wait a minute now. This is like, this is like crazy. That's when I knew they were wrong. Now, what all I'm saying is, you can, you can say, look, I think the eight benign tumors are, are are dangerous and you don't, okay, we can disagree on that, but you at least ought to tell people that there are benign tumors there. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That, that's because you don't want to have to have a fight with them about whether the tumors are or not dangerous. Exactly. You'll lose that battle because they have so much money to buy scientists. To get them to have a congressional investigation to open this whole issue up. I, I would not say that's your ultimate goal. I would say that's an intermediate goal. Yes. That's a process goal. It's a good goal. Yes. It's a really good thing to have. 
And, and uh, I, I personally, from listening to Kucinich today, I would argue that probably helping him get reelected so he could hold hearings like that's a really good thing. Exactly. I don't think Congresswoman Kafka will do that, I mean, because it's not her world. She's in a different world. I mean, she's working about poverty and civil rights, immigration, things like that. You know, and she's all doing good work on all that, but she's not on these kinds of issues. And I don't think there's anybody in Congress who's really on these issues the way Kucinich is. How could we help if we're not from this state? You well, uh, do you have a telephone? Do you know people in that part of the country? No, I'm you know, I'm from, Start. I don't have money. I, I have a telephone and I'm a hard worker. How could I help them? For, and I can organize 300 people to help them, but we're in New Mexico. You, you, okay, the first thing about organizing in my, uh, in my uh, process is uh, let's just say our goal is to help percentage. Yes. Okay, let's say first thing you do, no matter what it is, our goal is to get to the moon. Our goal is it. First thing you do is look at your own personal role. Who do you know? Okay. Who do you know? Okay. okay. And every time I go to a party, you know, I'm just saying, you know, every time I went to a party or every time I, I'd say, by the way, do you know anybody? And first of all, even before that, check the district, find out what the number of the district is, find out where it exists. Yes, it's, it's between Toledo and Cleveland. It's the east side of Cleveland and the west side of Toledo, and it goes okay. probably 40, 50 miles <coughs> south. Just pull it up on, pull it up on the okay. left. Okay. okay. Figure out where it is, and then everybody I talk to, everybody says, do you know anybody that lives in that area? Okay. Can you introduce me to them, because I want to talk to them about Congressman Kucinich? And what will happen, I'm pretty sure, I've never seen it fail, you will suddenly create a network okay. of Reach right into that northern Ohio district. All of you could do that if yeah. you want. Yes. If you want to, I, mean, yeah. I think we should. Don't you? Well, wait. It doesn't matter. Yeah. If you think you should, you should. No, and I if don't. you want to urge them to do it, they should do it. If they want to, they will. Exactly. See, I don't believe that it's really important to get a whole bunch of people together in a meeting and come up with a goal and then work on it. I think you can work on it. You can. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I have a couple of questions from our virtual uh, okay. participants. So let me read these off to you. So how can we get the tool to protect ourselves? Especially when the, the exposure is involuntary and even for Probably not um, uh, First of all, just so you know, the conversation that we were having here was how to lobby Congress, and that's what we were talking about. So if there was going to be something that Congress could do, you would do all the things I'm talking about, and that's the process I was describing. With regard to the uh, how to protect yourselves from an intrusion like that, again, I believe that the more information that you're able to bring to bear, the better. And I will tell you, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, I don't know where uh, you're you're worrying about the um, the um, uh, uh, intrusion coming from. If it's smart meters, and we're fighting a smart meter issue here in D.C., and uh, my son, who's a lawyer also, has formed up a relationship with the general counsel of the, um, the agency that's, uh, that's re that, that recognizes, you know, that re regulates the, uh, the utilities. And he's bringing law cases to them. He's bringing information to them. He's, he's informing them. He's saying, did you know about this? Did you know about that? And you need to understand that even, I'm not going to about people in Congress, being human beings that come from your hometown, there's a uniqueness about that. But even the people who are out there pushing these laws are human beings that can be reached in various ways. And uh, I'm, um, I'm a firm believer that when you put information into a system, the system begins to change. Uh, now, an individual, I would use, you know, I don't know exactly, you know, I'd have to you know, talk with the person who raised that question more directly and talk about what specific things they can do in their own neighborhood. <coughs> I, originally, I was thinking of schools. And one of the things that you want to do is find people in the system that you're trying to influence who will lean your way but don't have the leverage to lean that way. They don't have the political leverage. And you want to give them space so that they can do things that they would like to do but can't. And you need to find them. One of the reasons that there's so much business done in Washington at, at um, social gatherings is because people learn privately where the people in power actually stand, and then they work to create space so that the personal views of that individual can be more expressed in the political process. I mean, all those are, are tools, and uh, there's much, much more to talk about in, in defending against smart meters than what I've just said, but it just begins to give a little bit of a flavor. I think the whole tone, the whole approach, you want to be positive, you want information to flow. You want to you want to treat the people you're dealing with positively. Uh, I used uh, way way back uh, in the six in the late 60s, early 70s, 
I read uh, Eric Erickson's um, biography of Gandhi, and Gandhi had three, uh, three rules that he used or, or announced. One was um, that you're, uh, you, you should always treat your adversaries as human beings. Um, secondly, uh, don't tear down something that you don't have something to replace it with. Yeah. And then third, all change comes from the people. That's kind of the basic premises that I'm talking about. And uh, in, in, our, in our case on smart meters, we're, we're telling them to come and take the smart meter off the house and put the other one back. And we're making all the legal arguments why they have to do that. I mean, they just showed up selfly one day and put it out. We were out one in there and put the thing on the house. Pretty interesting. So we're saying you can't do that. First of all, it's trespassing. We don't want you to do that. We, don't, we didn't tell you yeah. to come there. As yeah. Is that a state-by-state state thing, or is that a national thing? That well, it's a, funny, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny issue because, you know, you talk about laws, but laws just shape behavior. And uh, these, these guys right now in the uh, corporate world don't really care too, too much about the law. Uh, yeah. uh, they'll, they'll pretty much do whatever they can get away with, and then, uh, and then, uh, then force you to have to fight against them. Right, which, um, which, which deflects your effort into the... Right. Into and deflecting your effort by the way, one of the main yeah. strategies that they have. Right. Deflect your effort onto something that's not really important to them. Uh, okay, you had another question back there from the virtual world? I think you really answered it. Both parts are doing the same thing. I think you okay. Right. Yeah, and, and, and if we had a session on how can I protect myself against smart meters which are intrusive and I don't have any control over them, I would have more to say about that issue in a, in a different vein. <coughs> well, that, they're actually the questions that long and very long. Do you want to ask me or do you want to ask me? Yes, yes, yes. Just ask the question now. That one? Yes. Well, the, the, uh, I, I use the same principles, and um, uh, uh, we, I was talking to Mary Beth uh, driving down again today, and she talked about how they started out going to PUC hearings, right, Mary Beth? Is that where you went? We what? When you started out pushing on smart meters, you started going to hearings? Oh, oh yeah. Well, we I went to um, all the city council meetings and city council meetings. Yeah, yeah. yeah in our whole county and and again you use the same principle get your rolodex out find your friends and see which ones of them will go with you find out who they know who will go with you um, um one of the there there are the, the culture that we're dealing with has some very strange ways of communicating and i've been in dozens and dozens of issues and there's one interesting dynamic that i find quite fascinating and i'll use it for the fluoride issue the, the national leader about why what we're doing with fluoride is bad uh, is a scientist, gold-plated scientist, been a personal, you know, been personally uh, lionized in science for years and years. And for a long time, as a professional scientist, his wife was saying, "You should look at this fluoride thing." He's saying, "I don't really want to. There's a bunch of crazy people." Yada yada. And she said, "Just look at it. Just look at it. Just look at it." So he said, okay, and he started looking at it scientifically, and he just totally got persuaded that the, what we're doing on fluoride is a disaster. That communication, and I think of it as an amateur talking to a professional, is a very powerful communication, but it only works where there's a strong personal relationship. You've got people in your Rolodex who know stuff that's really important, that if you can, you can talk to them on a personal basis, and you, and, you, and you need to be willing and able to grant them full confidentiality. And you talk to somebody that's got information and they say, I'm not, you know, I don't want to talk about it. It's my professional stuff. I'm only here, this is the party. You say, well, how about we get together somewhere else? You know, and pretty soon you can actually find in your own network or two, you know, two yeah. degrees of separation away, yeah. you'll find people who know what's going on in ways that will be very valuable to you in moving the whole issue forward. And many, many times they're trying to find a way to get it out. So if you work from yourself out to your own community, to your own, your own personal relationship, your community, and then well, what I'm saying I'm lobbying is you bring that to the direct individual who's a part of your community who's been hired by you to represent you in the national power centers. And then the next thing we're doing is translating that to the local state legislators and doing exactly the same thing with the state legislators and going up on the, in the capital of the state and having these meetings and talking to them and getting them to be involved. And you might want to start inviting them, get friendly with them, get to know them. The next thing we want to do is train people who are in that community so they can run for office and then we're in office and they're coming to talk to us. That's the big whole picture. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, we, I have a
some of us have meetings starting at 11, so thank you so much. Thank you.